Thanks. Um, so the original invite was for Jim Gilmore, who's our division director. He is at the Atlantic States Commission meeting this week, so you get the runner-up. Um, so just a quick outline. Um, so first I'll talk really briefly about interstate fisheries management and how those jurisdictions interact. Um, very shallow treatment of climate change impacts and how species respond, and then we're going to talk more about black sea bass. Um, some of it's going to be overlapping, but it is packed a little differently, and hopefully you'll get something new out of it. And then finally, I'll just kind of briefly talk about why management response to climate change is so difficult and what we've done so far. So uh, the Regional Council System, established uh, by the Max and Stevens Act in 1976, which essentially extended uh, American authority over fisheries out to 200 miles from 12 miles, um, essentially kicking the um, foreign fishing fleets out of uh, our natural waters, um, uh, in, in addition to requiring uh, more sustainable fishery management, it also established regional councils uh, throughout the country, um, but with uh, three in particular on the east coast of the United States. Uh, so the New England Council goes from Maine to Connecticut, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council goes from New York to North Carolina, and the South Atlantic Council goes from South Carolina to Florida. Um, and so their job largely is advisory uh, to the federal government, and uh, anything that they propose ultimately must be put into reg uh, regulation by now. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission was established in 1942, and its, um, its job is to largely manage fisheries within state waters, so zero to three miles out. Um, it was done far before the uh, MSA was enacted, and uh, that's because some visionaries realized that transboundary fish had to be managed uh, cooperatively. Uh, all states along the East Coast, from Maine to Florida, um, are part of the ASMFC. And uh, I do not know exactly how they functioned prior, uh, but two uh, particular pieces of, pieces of federal legislation were put in place that gave the commission some uh, teeth, essentially, requiring states to actually comply with what was otherwise Cooperative. So the divisions between uh, the various commissions and councils are not clean. Uh, there's lots of overlap in species. Uh, sometimes this is due to uh, where fisheries are prosecuted. Uh, so some aspects of the fishery may occur in state waters, uh, whereas others are in federal waters. For example, many many recreational fisheries fall within the uh, direct management by the ASMFC, whereas the commercial fisheries often fall um, under the Council. Uh, there's other fisheries that exist almost uh, entirely within the ASMC, like American eel, which is uh, pretty appropriate given that most of its life cycle is spent uh, in inland waters, and once they hit the ocean, we really don't know where they go. Um, then you have species like uh, black sea bass, for example. I'm sorry. Um, so that's both that's managed by both the council and the commission. Um, but uh, recreational a aspects of recreational management are managed by the council, and aspects are managed by the uh, commission and the same for commercial, which makes so basically every single fishery management plan is unique and confusing. <laughs> so, uh, and climate change is occurring everywhere. Every commission and council that I'm aware of is dealing with it, uh, and uh, climate change acts in different and complex ways. Um, there's temperature driven effects that actually directly affect a species uh, that has to interact with current and past uh, fishing pressure. And then finally, um, species that um, may also be impacted by climate that uh, result in increased competition for the species we're discussing, or uh, changes in its food availability, for example. The black sea bass, which we've heard so much about already, um, member of the grouper family. Uh, there are three stocks along the east coast, but the one I'm going to talk about, uh, managed by the Mid-Atlantic, it goes from uh, Massachusetts, North Carolina, although as we've heard, with extensions into the Gulf of Maine. Uh, it is structure oriented, but not nowhere near as structure oriented as group, other grouper species. Uh, a, a sand wave is enough for a black sea bass. Um, so uh, they are potentious hermaphrodites, which means they do change sex, or they, they can change sex. Um, females uh, can turn into males, but we also know that there are nine inch males that are sexually mature, and there are 16 inch females that are uh, remain female. So it is, no, uh, it is not obligated. Uh, they do undergo intro offshore migrations. Uh, Janet covered that. And uh, it's uh, important to commercial and recreational fisheries up and down. 
uh, the uh, middle end. And finally, again, the client is jointly managed by both the ASMC and the middle end council. So, uh, you've heard a lot of this, but certainly there is uh, abundant evidence for a climate driven shift. Val et al. Uh, analyzed the uh, um, federal uh, troll survey data up through 2008 and found that the long shelf sensor of biomass had a positive relationship with spring. Warmer springs and the uh, biomass was, uh, center of biomass was located further north. And in particular, the distribution along the shelf was dictated by bottom water temperature with that eight degrees Celsius uh, being the sweet spot. Um, Walsh et al. in 2015 looked at distribution of adults and larvae from multiple species and they compared, compared two different decades, uh, the 1980s and the 2000s. Uh, and while Walsh didn't find um, a change in mature sea bass distribution, he did find sea bass larvae occurring further north, more inshore, and later in season uh, in the second decade. Uh, they didn't directly analyze any climate variables, but they did attribute the shift to climate change. And finally, Henderson et al., again, analyzing that incredible um, Science Center data set, uh, looked at changes in response to time and spring warming, uh, defined as sea surface temperatures being uh, constant at 8 degrees Celsius, and summer duration. Now, whoops, again, again. You can see how highly variable that, that spring warming is. Um, and I suppose if you, you squint, you might see a trend there. Um, but uh, nevertheless, Black Sea Bass Center biomass was located further north in years of earlier warming, and I think uh, someone else had already shown that. Um, they also looked at the trend in essentially the length of the growing period, so how long the summer lasted. And certainly, the center of biomass was located further north during those longer summers, and they also uh, believed that the longer growing period may lead to increased biomass. So early black fishery management, uh, the fishery management plan was uh, instituted in 1996 for black sea bass. And essentially you have a 50-50 uh, split between the commercial and recreational fisheries in terms of allocation. Since 2003, that commercial allocation has um, been divided uh, into state-specific allocations. Um, commercial minimum size set at 9 inches initially has slowly crept up to 11 inches and has been that way since 2002. The, um, the plan includes mesh sizes and escape vents that allow for reducing uh, discards. And finally, uh, access is restricted by uh, a number of different types of limited entry federal and state <coughs> permits. The recreational fishery also taking approximately 50% of the total allowable landings uh, was managed on a coast-wide basis until uh, 2011 when uh, changes in patterns of catch um, started um, required a uh, more regional or state-specific management. So the magnuson Stephen Act, uh, which was established a long time ago, has been reauthorized a number of times. And in 2007, it started requiring fuller consideration of sources of uncertainty and discards when um, setting catch limits. Uh, and the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, implemented these for black sea bass in 2012. So uh, brief assessment history. Uh, through 2008, the uh, black sea bass was considered a data poor species. Um, so we used uh, far less sophisticated models because there was far less data to, um, to be used. Uh, catch and length model in 2009 indicated that stock was not overfished and there was no any overfishing. But because of the uncertainty uh, in the, the estimates of biomass and the bio biological reference points, uh, it wasn't used for management. Uh, a catch and age model. Uh, in 2011, the field failed peer review, uh, despite the fact that the catch at age and the catch at length uh, both showed uh, a similar uh, healthy stock. So, uh, due to uncertainty, the councils couldn't actually set catch limits based on stock assessment advice. Uh, so, the Council Science and Statistical Committee uh, used a constant catch, <coughs> which is essentially looking at a time series of, of catches and choosing some inter intermediate level of catch. Uh, so, at this point in 2010, they set it at the 16th percentile. Uh, on top of that is the new uh, requirements of Maxin to um, account for discards. So now that former landings limit became a catch limit and was further uh, decreased by uh, accounting for discards. Um, constraining recreational fishery landings in the north uh, very quickly became a difficult thing to do 
uh, and the SSC was repeatedly uh, asked to revise its constant catch, and eventually they did in 2013 uh, using the 50th percentile of uh, uh, catch time series. Northern catch problems uh, continue to be a problem. So here you can see this is uh, recreational landings data uh, from 2000 to 2015. Um, 2010 is when the uh, state is the last year in which uh, coastwide measures were in place, and then they switched to some kind of regional or state-specific measures after that. Uh, so this is the south, uh, uh, defined as New Jersey through Virginia. Uh, you can see it kind of declined uh, in the early 2000s and continued to, to kind of uh, remain somewhat stable. Meanwhile, in the north, uh, catch limits were increasing, uh, and it is this increase right here that led to the changeover from coastwide measures to uh, state-specific <coughs> measures. All states enacted uh, increased restrictions in 2011, um, but uh, since then the southern state regulations have stayed largely the same at around 12 and a half inches. Uh, over this time, the um, northern state uh, limits increased from 12 and a half inch size limit to 14 inch size limit, shorter seasons, and decreased possession. In addition, uh, interest in sea bass was increasing commercially in the northern states. Um, now, this is arguably an easier fishery to control because you've got, um, you know, daily daily records, uh, daily trip reporting, and you can use trip limits and and closures uh, informed by quota monitor. Whereas recreational harvest data comes in, uh, let's see, 45 days after. Uh, every two month period ends, uh, and therefore management on a real time basis is incredibly difficult. Uh, the SSC, again under uh, intense pressure to revise their um, catch limits, uh, asked for additional information. And Jason McNamee, uh, someone in the uh, monitoring committee and technical committees uh, for uh, the ASMC and the Mid-Atlantic Council, used the data limit toolbox to provide uh, additional catch advice, which the uh, SSC uh, adopted. So why was catch becoming such a problem in the North? Uh, we've heard a little bit about 2011 year class. Uh, H1 in 2012 was seen consistently in state, state surveys, but only from Massachusetts through New York, and also in federal surveys, but only in what we would call Northern Strata, divided roughly at the Hudson Canyon. So this is the uh, Northern Strata in the federal survey, and here's that 2011 year class in 2012 is H1s when the survey uh, more consistently picks them up, although I wouldn't say they're fully recruited to the Federal Patrol Survey at that time. Uh, and you can also see that such events were pretty rare uh, prior to that point. Uh, this is the southern H1 indices. And you can see that they periodically have recruitment events that um, feed the fishery. And just to show you that this wasn't just in federal waters, this is a, um, a spring survey index from New York State showing that same 2012 year class spike and that same pattern of relatively low uh, noticeable improvement in prior years. Why was that year class rate so, so strong? And I don't think that those uh, indices I just showed you really um, tell that story. Um, so those fish are now six and seven years old and they still dominate commercial and recreational catch in the north. So that, um, that year class has been fished on heavily uh, since it entered the fishery in around 2013 and it is Still done. Um, so uh, Janice certainly talk, talked a little bit about this. Uh, Miller et al. Um, someone working with Gary Shepard, investigated black sea bass distribution along the coast. Um, and just as Janet talked about, warmer water, high salinity, and uh, what they call low shelf water volume um, seem to uh, determine the dis distribution of uh, young of the year uh, black sea bass along the shelf. 1997 was a fairly typical year. And this red line here is that eight degree uh, Celsius um, ice. And you can see that catches of black sea bass occurred largely, uh, juvenile black sea bass occurred largely outside of that line. Uh, this water would all be too cold for uh, survival black sea bass. In two, that winter, between 2011 and 2012, you had almost the entire coastline bathed in this warm, salty water. And uh, so therefore, you had uh, black, juvenile black sea bass distributed throughout the shelf. And um, that short distance uh, during their migration for both adults and juveniles uh, 
meant uh, lower energy demands and much greater um, overwintering survival. So, um, now a benchmark assessment uh, for 2016, as I mentioned, the previous uh, assessment in 2011 failed peer review, when one of the recommendations from that peer review was to consider stock structure. Um, there was trouble tracking cohorts, um, uh, and there's also tagging evidence that suggested there was, in fact, uh, some stock structure in the mid-Atlantic light. Uh, we, for the purposes of uh, modeling, uh, we divided, divided the, uh, the stock at roughly the Hudson Canyon. Now there's, um, so the consistency in patterns of recruitment, tagging data that Moser and Shepard did that showed there were difference, differences in patterns of both uh, offshore and shore migration, and also that tagged fish essentially returned to where they were tagged, uh, sometimes within 10 kilometers. Um, and there was very little straying and, uh, uh, in, in tag returns when caught by commercial fisheries. So essentially, if you were tagged in the north and returned to the north, I think only 7% of northern uh, tagged northern fish uh, were uh, return tags from northern fish were caught in the south, and I think 0.07% of, of southern fish uh, that were strayed to the north. Finally, uh, genetics work. Um, there is no solid conclusive evidence of uh, genetic structure here, but there certainly seems to be some kind of uh, north to south variation uh, that I hope one day uh, science has done and, and, and uh, reinforces that idea. And finally, patterns of recreational catch per unit effort. Um, uh, recreational harvest in the northern states uh, continue to climb despite uh, ever more restrictive measures. Now you can see that uh, overlaid on this map, here's a, roughly our division, and here you see the uh, Federal Control Survey data, and then you have, of course, the states, this is New York, and, and the rest of the states in uh, southern New England, here's what we call the Middle Atlantic down North Carolina. These boxes are uh, NIMS statistical areas, and that's how uh, the feds capture uh, marine fisheries uh, commercial landings data. So we had to partition things in a, in a very rough manner. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, it was the best we could do at the time, and I think it led to some of the, uh, the bias that we later saw in the uh, individual, um, we're called regional models. So uh, Gary Shepard uh, was in charge of both the 2011 assessment and the 2016 assessment, and he was a very busy uh, in between those two, addressing a lot of the uh, research concerns that the prior group reviews had um, brought up. Uh, so we did successfully model uh, the stock uh, with uh, two region structure, um, and we passed peer review, of course. And what you see here is the uh, orange is the southern biomass. And so again, that's everything south of the Hudson Canyon, um, roughly states of New Jersey through North Carolina. And you can see how it Kind of peaked in 2002, there was that uh, recruitment event that uh, um, one of the other presentations alluded to. Um, and then it declined uh, until 2006, then it's 2007, and you have this slow increase. Meanwhile, in the northern states had a relatively low level biomass. Up until 2007, you start to see that little bit of a climb. And then this is largely that 2011 year class just growing and blowing up the biomass. Um, now, uh, these units, these uh, regional uh, assessments were never meant to be standalone, and ultimately we did combine them, and we did have to correct for retrospective bias, which is why you have this, this disconnect. Um, so what you have here is the assessment output. This is uh, total allowable landings at the time, and then this is the, uh, the biomass projections moving forward, showing basically the uh, <coughs> You know, fishing down of of the biomass, and in particular that 2011 year class, and these are the um, new total allowable landings established uh, based on the assessment. Now we had this beautiful assessment, this beautiful biomass, which was at 230 percent of the target, and uh, our allowable landings level increased by that much. So you can imagine how unimpressed all our fishermen were um, when they got this. Thing. So. Catch limits increased slightly. Uh, the recreational fishery, at least in the north, was in constant annual danger of exceeding federal catch limits. And every year, the uh, technical committee had to come up with new and creative justifications for why uh, additional reductions weren't required. Uh, there was some slight relief for the commercial fishermen, but uh, the projections indicated the biomass would decrease, uh, essentially fishing down that year class. 
and cash limits had to decline accordingly. Uh, and finally, um, a new assessment incorporating data through 2018 will be completed, completed in 2019 to be used for 2020 management. Um, that's pretty much about as fast as it goes for these assessments, so there's almost always a two-year lag. And you can imagine how frustrating that is for fishermen um, waiting for uh, something that, um, I guess, uh, shows us what they're seeing anecdotally. So what kind of new developments do we, can we expect? So the 2015 year class is also very strong, and it's also more of a coast-wide phenomenon. It's been seen in state and federal surveys, basically from Maryland all the way through Massachusetts. And um, I was kind of hoping that I might see someone analyze the uh, oceanographic conditions in the 2015-2016 winter to see how that um, matched up, but I haven't actually seen that done anywhere yet. Um, the federal program that collects uh, recreational harvest estimates coast-wide uh, altered drastically how it collects and quantifies effort, and the time series essentially slowly increases up by uh, up to 150% um, in uh, 2017. So we, it remains to be seen how well our, our uh, earlier assessment model um, will handle those changes. So it would be great to have another peer review failure and uh, go back to some other catch advice. Anyway, problems persist. Uh, it is likely that uh, black sea bass is a species that will see greater productivity in a warming climate, likely more consistently in the northern part of the region. I think that was mentioned um, in, the, in uh, earlier talks. Uh, the northern recreational fishery remains heavily constrained while the um, restricted regulations, uh, well, and while regulations in the New Jersey South are, are more lenient. Um, size limits in New York and North are now 15 inches, bag limits between three, five, and seven fish, and, uh, and, and seasons that sometimes don't open until late June, whereas uh, largely in the South, you've got uh, 12 and a half inches, 15 bag, uh, limits and fisheries that go from May through December. Uh, in addition, current uh, commercial state-by-state -state allocations, which were established in 2003 on uh, data even older than that, uh, put 33% of the annual coast-wide commercial quota uh, in New York and North and 67% in states New Jersey and South. And while New York and Rhode Island and Massachusetts certainly have something to complain about, I think Connecticut kind of takes the cake here. They have 1% of the coast-wide commercial quota currently, and as I said, this was established here uh, based upon this information, uh, you know, landings data from this period of time. And this is a index of black sea bass abundance in the Long Island Sound. So you can see what kind of problems they might have when uh, this is the new reality uh, and we're still managing based upon that. So, why is this so difficult? <laughs> well, data need to become greater with more complex systems. Um, the original scale model had a uh, one-time step, annual. It had one region. Um, and the newer model had two time steps. So it's kind of essentially spring and, and winter. It had two regions. And each one of those cells then has to be populated with appropriate uh, length composition data for the, the harvests and appropriate uh, age length keys. And this was the data for stock in 2008. Uh, finally, impacts of climate change are highly species specific based on life history and how it interacts with, uh, with other elements in its environment. Uh, the impacts of climate change on a given species aren't smooth and unidirectional. Um, if things just continued like, uh, like uh, it has, and we continue to see these isolated um, northern region year class events, That'd be a very easy story to tell, but instead we have the 2015 year class, which by all accounts is a coast-wide phenomenon. So it's obviously it's erratic, uh, and no, I'm certainly not going to argue that there's that slow trend up higher, but um, it's not going to be it's not going to be a smooth trend. Um, more complexity equals uh, more uncertainty, and um, usually uncertainty cuts only one way when it comes to fish setting fishery catch limit. Now that might be appropriate when you have a species that you are deeply concerned about. But when you have a um, species like black sea bass, which was at 230% of its biomass target, um, according to the last assessment in 2014, um, and you're telling fishermen that they have to take less, it's a very difficult conversation to have. We actually have uh, someone who drives around in a van. The big picture of black sea bass says 
lettuce fish. In every meeting, that guy is there. So, uh, so change is very difficult. Uh, states and fishermen have invested a lot in their management structure. Um, and so, so it's not always so easy to change it because those individuals aren't willing. For example, um, many states, North Carolina and then New Jersey and North, uh, run their commercial black sea bass fishery on a you know, pretty, um, pretty traditional trip limit, quota period, quota monitoring system. Whereas the states, uh, Delaware through Virginia, have ITQs, individual transferable quotas. So in the event that we do mix up the system and change those allocations, how does that, fact, how does that, how does that impact all these individuals who have had ITQs, ITQs for years and, um, uh, and have invested a lot of money in, in their equipment and in that structure? Finally, process and timing. Um, in some years, I'm not done with recreational fisheries management until late May. Um, we just get those regulations in before the season opens. That process probably started in October. And then as soon as uh, July comes, we'll probably get new catch limit advice for the following fishing. So you overlay all that process and all that delay in two years to get an assessment in place. And then on top of that, you want to initiate large-scale revamping of fishery processes. It's a very difficult thing to do, and it's exhausting. <laughs> so, and one of the last and most difficult things about uh, um, fishery management and, uh, and trying to manage in a changing environment is the allocations. Extremely difficult, because it's always an argument between the haves and have-nots. Uh, fisheries are important to individuals and community identities, and I think we saw a lot of that in a previous talk. <coughs> fisheries are also a very big business. Uh, in addition to your X vessel and market prices, you have for hire fishing vessels charging fares, bait and tackle retail sales, uh, all that shore stride infrastructure that supports recreational and commercial industries. And finally, you have taxes and revenue and politics. <coughs> and no state wants to forego revenue, and certainly no politician wants to uh, allow a manager under their regime to quietly give away their allocation without a plan. So what has occurred so far? Well, every council and commission has a group that considers climate change impacts the stocks they manage. Um, I think you saw a little bit of that in that Hair et al. paper in uh, 2016, um, which was that multicolored figure looking at climate sensitivity and climate, um, what was the other axis? Um, vulnerability, essentially, uh, um, or exposure. Uh, so the Mid-Atlantic Council has uh, formally adopted that into some of their documents. Um, Investigations of a species response to environmental variables are now regularly included in the assessment terms of reference. We certainly did for black sea bass, I know it was done for summer flounder. Um, and some stocks are now having to be considered in light of changing natural mortality rates, recruitment levels, and overall stock productivity because what was the norm is, is obviously no longer necessarily possible to achieve. And I think you heard a little bit about that in prior discussion about that. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge some of the people that certainly informed and influenced my talk. Um, the working group for the 62nd uh, SOSARC, which was the Black Sea Best Benchmark Stock Assessment in particular. Um, Gary Shepard, who a lot of the figures you saw, I, I pulled from some of his data updates to the council. Uh, the many talented individuals that I've worked with um, in uh, technical and monitoring committees for the council and commission. And finally, the sea marine resources staff that have contributed to my knowledge and allowed me to ignore them for the last two days. <laughs> 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 <laughs>